we will begin our session. Um, again, thank you so much. Um, this webinar is part of our Slew for Sim series focused on all of the wonderful opportunities here at St. Louis University within the STEM fields. I am beyond thrilled to have three of our really excellent um, faculty um, from our School of Science and Engineering, um, Dr. Kandur and Dr. Zustik, um, Sylvia and Sridhar, who are from our MS in Engineering program, as well as Dr. Letcher, David Letcher, who is from our Department of Computer Science. Um, all of these departments live in our new School of Science and Engineering, and we are just thrilled to have them today. Um, our faculty are very busy, but they always take time to make sure that we're really doing this specialized touch point for all of our prospective and new incoming students. So um, to the three of you, thank you so much. Um, I will go ahead and get started. And um, when we get to the individual program sections, um, we'll um, give a little bit of time for our faculty to introduce themselves, and then we'll dive right into the programs. Um, all right. So um, again, Today, we'll be covering our MS in Engineering, MS in Computer Science, MS in Artificial Intelligence, and our MS in Software Engineering. So we have a lot of ground to cover. Uh, so without further ado, I'll give a quick brief overview of St. Louis University and why students choose and are successful uh, studying at our institution. And then we'll dive right into our program, starting with MS and engineering. Uh, St. Louis University is a historic institution founded over 200 years ago in 1818. Um, one thing that is a hallmark of the SLU education, I always tell students, is the community. Um, the access that students will have to our expert faculty, which is evidenced today by the fact that we have three of our wonderful faculty who have taken time to be a part of this event. Um, this is part of the entire SLU experience. Students will have direct access with our faculty or who are doing the research, who are experts in the field. And this is highly unusual at institutions of our level. Typically students, you know, are maybe working with grad assistants or they don't have that direct contact. And I think that is overarching one thing that is part of this private university Jesuit education model that we really focus on. Um, we are a research intensive institution. Students have many opportunities to be involved in research, which we will cover today. Um, we have about 12,000 students, over 1,200 international students. So we're about 10% international, a very diverse population with students from more than 75 countries globally who are focused on um, the research intensive environment that we do provide. Um, at St. Louis University, your education here will be um, really well known, both locally, nationally, and globally. We're ranked in the top 3% of all American institutions, nationally ranked this year at 105. Um, this really places us within an elite group of institutions. So, you know, whether you're coming from China, India, Brazil, um, Africa, you can have that confidence that knowing an education at SLU will really propel you both academically, professionally, and onward into your career, whether you're doing an academic career or professionally focused um, uh, degree. Um, lastly, we are very highly ranked as a best value school. And this is really looking at the investment that you're making in your education and the return on that investment. And I always tell students, especially international students, um, you know, you're looking for careers, you're looking for opportunities. And being focused on these STEM programs that allows you to do OPT, that gives you more opportunity. But the fact that you have this built-in network with faculty who you're getting to meet throughout this entire journey here at SLU will really propel you in your opportunities if you stay engaged in our academic environment. So that's just a little bit of a profile of SLU. Um, let's go ahead and dive into the School of Science and Engineering. Just a quick overview. Um, we've recently had a wonderful change where we've combined um, the, in the traditional engineering school with some of our traditional science programs, which is why we have our faculty here today from MS Engineering, as well as computer science. This really helps leverage all the resources internally, both from a faculty perspective and a research perspective to really have an interdisciplinary environment where students are leveraging all of the vast resources, both from our faculty and laboratories that we have on campus. So that's a really wonderful um, change that we have made. So the programs that we'll be covering today are engineering and the computer science department. So without further ado, let's dive right into MS and engineering. And 
Sylvia and uh, Sweetheart, maybe if you can just give a really quick brief introduction um, of you, how you arrived at SLU and the programs that you cover, and then we'll get right into your degree program. So Sweetheart, maybe we'll uh, start off real quickly with you. My journey to SLU is I came from India. I did in IIT Bombay, came to uh, Texas A&M, graduated from Texas A&M. Then in 96, I joined SLU. And it's a great community, great school. So since 96, that's like 25 plus years I've been here. And uh, sweetheart, you're over which mechanics. programs? I deal with aerospace and mechanical engineering programs. Wonderful, thank you. And Sylvia? Hello, um, I'm Sylvia Zustia, and I am originally from Bulgaria. I did my bachelor's and master's degree at Technical University in Bulgaria, and then I came to US. I did my PhD uh, at University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and then I did my postdoc uh, at an NAH, National Institute of Health. So my training is in chemical engineering and biophysics, but I am now overseeing the biomedical engineering programs. Wonderful. Thank you both. Well, we'll go ahead and dive in. And Sylvia, since we'll start with your program, if you can kind of just maybe give us a high level overview of what makes the SLU MS and engineering program really unique. Um, we, you know, we do have a variety of concentration areas. Um, what are some highlights that you always like to tell students specifically about our program? Well, I really wanted to first kind of emphasize the fact that even though we, you will get an MS in engineering, we do have a variety of concentrations. So your degree will actually say MS engineering concentration in the specific program. And so the specific programs live within the departments uh, at, at, the state, uh, at our college. Uh, so we have aerospace, mechanical, biomedical, civil, electrical and computer and engineering physics. So as you can see many, many concentrations to choose from. Um, again, the highlights for us uh, is that you know students get access to faculty um, as faculty we have open door policy especially for our graduate students so the open door policy means that at any time you have a question or you have a concern you can come to us we offer non-thesis options for masters but we also offer thesis and the project option that's something to keep in mind so the non-thesis is going to be our traditional just taking classes um, 30 credit hours of classes and then the project option is you take classes but you also get an opportunity to do a project with a faculty directly independent project independent research in a faculty lab you do not have to do a thesis for that the thesis the thesis degree then is going to be you conducting independent research uh, and taking classes so both of all of those options are available to students Oh, wonderful. And that, that's a, a really good segue um, to the curriculum slide I have here. Uh, maybe Sylvia and Sridhar, could both of you maybe um, speak about briefly one project in your area that maybe a student or an international student has worked on just to help kind of demystify a project versus thesis, maybe something a student has, has done? So one of our students, um, his name is Vignan. He came from India. He worked on... Um, with the medical school. Uh, he's a mechanical engineering, the thesis project involved using uh, uh, software to scan the brain, create a 3D model of the brain, a simulator where the neurosurgeon can actually perform the operation on the brain, skull, everything before actually doing operation on the patient. Oh, wow. Okay. So the entire thing uh, was about three semesters he took. So in the process, he learned 3D printing, medical technologies and everything. He's right now working for a medical company in Detroit. Wonderful. And I think that's a really great one to highlight too, Dark, because you see the interdisciplinary nature of our program, you know, working with the School of Medicine, which is outside the School of Engineering. So that's a wonderful example. Um, and Sylvia, you had mentioned the program is a 30 credit hour um, degree program. Typically, what is a, a typical completion? One and a half to two years with the workload? So a typical completion is two years. Typically, students would take about 15 credit hours per year. So 16 credit hours per semester is required for international students to be full-time students. And then they can take another three credit hours over the summer, or they can simply take nine over the semester. But the typical completion for non-thesis, and actually all of them, it's, it's two years. Um, what's different between a project and a master and the thesis is that the project is typically self-contained, small, um, a smaller scope, something that you can complete within a semester. 
and that you're only given free credit hours, kind of just like a class. Mm -hmm. For the thesis, the thesis goes on for the whole two years, and it culminates in you writing a manuscript, which is called the thesis, that eventually is published. Um, and so that has to be done in more cost collaboration with, with advisor, and it requires a lot more dedication. So even though students only get six credit hours for research, really um, a lot more work is required to complete the thesis. But then the rewards are, of course, maybe a little bit higher simply because you get to delve into research uh, a lot deeply. With oh, great. Thesis. Well, and I, I'm really glad you said research. I, you're, you're ahead of me on um, some of the different laboratories and um, the areas and institutes at St. Louis University. Uh, maybe if each of you could talk about some of the areas of research that you conduct or that you're working on or areas of interest um, within biomedical or aerospace and mechanical. Um, maybe Sridhar, do you want to start us off with some areas that you work on specifically and um, highlights for our program at SLU? So there are three areas I would look at. One is we have a really uh, wonderful entrepreneurship center. Okay, CHAFE is a uh, center of entrep for entrepreneurship. So this center cuts across business and engineering schools. So we are creating a very entrepreneurial ecosystem. So students have ideas, they can realize them, maybe start a business, and they work with startup community. There's a fairly big uh, mentoring program going on. We have a fairly large amount of funding from uh, Kern Entrepreneurship Education Network. So it's a network of schools, a private donor is funding. So entrepreneurship is one big area. The second one is additive manufacturing. So uh, as I talked earlier, I'm involved in additive manufacturing. We are right now working with cardiology department and developing a 3D printed valve. So that would be a second area I would uh, talk about myself. And we have a wonderful mechatronics lab. This is much more a teaching lab. Mm -hmm. Students learn programmable logic controllers, robotics, and how to do factory automation. So that is something that would help students to get a job once they graduate. Wonderful. Always on that career focus. That's a, a really great highlight. So maybe a, a quick highlight on, in the biomedical area, some research that maybe you're working on or the um, SLU is really famous for. So in the biomedical engineering department, we uh, have a very strong program in biomaterials and tissue engineering, regenerative engineering and drug delivery. Uh, so this particular research is more on the forefront of the biomedical engineering field. Uh, it has to do, for example, what my lab is doing. We are developing drug delivery devices for biologic molecules. Biologics are new drugs, let's say, that um, you know, otherwise cannot really be distributed throughout the body. So the only way to actually get <coughs> them to be effective for patients is going to be to deliver them properly. So we are <coughs> the designers behind those delivery devices. We also built um, models of tumors, like small tumors in the lab that then we can use to screen new, new therapies for patients. But there's a lot more going on. Um, for example, we have faculty who works in wound healing, somebody who works in musculoskeletal tissue regeneration or stem cells. Um, then we have somebody who is doing biomechanics research, movement biomechanics, robotics. We also have surgical robotics and also artificial intelligence um, and, and neuroscience. So by the way, if you look at those pictures, those are both BME pictures, of course, the one, <laughs> those are our BME labs. Um, and um, we do have every faculty in our department conduct research, uh, which is really also great for teaching because we bring the research in the classroom and we bring you the newest, the newest and greatest from our field uh, in our lectures as well. Wonderful. And thank you for that. You know, and I think for all of our counselors and especially the students that are attending for MS in engineering, um, we are very highly regarded for these three areas that we have our faculty here for biomedical, um, aerospace and mechanical. So we're really super excited to have you all. Um, and what I'll do, I'll transition over a little bit um, in two parts, aerospace and then mechanical. Sridhar, can you kind of give us a brief overview of aerospace? Because this is such an incredibly unique program um, at SLU because many universities don't offer this and we are highly specialized in this particular area. So aerospace engineering program at SLU is one of the first few aerospace engineering programs uh, that started in about 1930s. So it's almost like 90 years old or 80 years old. Um, we have uh, probably some of the best wind tunnel facilities 
our wind tunnels are, uh, we have a large subsonic wind tunnel. And what you see in the picture is a supersonic wind tunnel. We have a UAV lab. Uh, we have people working on drones. We have a flight cage. We work with uh, the military uh, civilian thing. We have geospatial center. All of them work with UAV. Um, we have a space systems lab, which would help people to get into NASA as well as SpaceX. SpaceX is a startup, a uh, small one. We placed almost six students in the last three years in SpaceX. So whether you want to go on the space side or aero side, the program prepares you very well. Wonderful. And then maybe a couple of quick highlights on uh, mechanical, um, which is a high specialty for area for you. So the, on the mechanical side, we uh, look at mechatronics, PLC, robotics, automation. That's one area that is uh, pretty unique. And uh, the robotics, uh, we have a haptics lab, which deals with uh, touch sensitive uh, uh, devices. That's fairly good. We have structures area where you can do modeling, simulation, uh, CFD, uh, all of them that would help you to get into automotive industry or aerospace industry. Oh, interesting. Okay, perfect. Um, and I, I've got one kind of final area here for both of you. Um, you know, we talk a lot about careers, and I think for international students, it, it's not dissimilar to domestic students, but international students, you know, as you know, you, you both are very intimately aware, are making a big investment and in, in, in coming to another country for this education. And I always love to highlight some of the really great outcomes that students can expect, um, you know, Finishing a degree in STEM is great because they have the additional OPT, um, but when we look at the field of engineering more broadly, it has some very high outcomes from, you know, availability of jobs, um, you know, earning potential. Um, but maybe, sweetheart, Sylvia, you know, before we kind of conclude this section and move on to computer science, can maybe you talk about one or two highlights from a career perspective, whether employers who are contacting you all kind of seeking, you know, graduates or kind of connections students have made, or even a great anecdote or highlight of an international student or other student who's gone onward in a really wonderful career trajectory. Maybe, Sylvia, from your area? So from my I might I might say that uh, many of our students go also on to a higher degrees like a doctorate, mm -hmm. a medical school. Uh, many of them, however, end up in industry. So big big employers for us would be, uh, let's say, biopharmaceutical companies or medical device companies. Honestly, like any company that provides any kind of um, either supplies or um, equipment for the medical industry. And as you know, the health industry is really like the number one growing industry right now uh, in US. So our students basically have 100% employment, whatever they want to do after they graduate. International students, I mean, I myself have had uh, several in my lab and uh, most of them actually end up in, in, in a graduate degree, like end up in uh, top universities uh, doing a PhD degree. Uh, but I do have some people who went to Medtronic um, or Boston Scientific, Thermo Fisher Scientific. All of those are international companies that have global reach. Uh, so typically, I mean, I know, and from a American engineering perspective, usually employees are very happy to see an advanced degree such as master's, master's um, in biomedical engineering before, you know, that just like if put students at a higher starting position um, and, and basically makes them really attractive to, to uh, employees. So, and of course, the median salary for us is also very high. Some of our students are starting even at higher than 80,000. 80, so I think um, it's an it's excellent, excellent investment. Wonderful. And Sritar, from your area and experience? Um, St. Louis, uh, there's uh, two types of companies. The big companies, there are a lot of them. Uh, several Fortune 500 companies are there. There are also a lot of startup ecosystem. We are located next to Cambridge Innovation Center, which is a startup community. So a lot of our students go attend Venture Cafe, meet the startup community every Thursday evening. And that's how you could build a network. And several of them end up in a smaller companies, D-Climate, things like that. Um, salaries are good. Um, 
when uh, I happen to be looking at the list of uh, people, there's somebody whose last name is Kota. This one student, his last name was also Kota. He ended up in D Climate, which is a startup. He graduated two years ago and doing really good. Right now, he's transitioning to H1. And we normally are in touch with our students who graduate. Wonderful. Well, and I think that's exemplary of what I was mentioning at the beginning for everyone. You know, as students here, it's a really full cycle from the, you know, the beginning of working with our faculty, getting interested in our programs all the way through becoming alumni. It's a really supportive environment, um, a very academic environment as well. So, sweetheart and Sylvia, thank you so much. Um, we're going to transition to the computer science department, but if both of you can hang around um, at the end for any questions, if you have time, that would be great. Um, and for our participants who have joined, um, I know we have one question in the chat. Um, we'll take questions at the end, but if you want to put it in the chat throughout, um, we can address it then. Um, so again, Sylvia, sweetheart, thank you so much. We'll come back for questions if you can hang around. And then now um, it's my great pleasure to move on to our computer science department, which lives within the School of Science and Engineering as well. Um, Dr. Letcher, David Letcher is with us, and he's going to give us a, a great overview of three of our really highly popular um, degree programs in computer science. So David, do you want to give us just a, a quick introduction of yourself and maybe some of the research you're doing and we'll dive into your programs. Sure, so um, I got my PhD at University of Michigan um, after being at University of California, San Diego and Oklahoma State, along with visiting positions at Stanford and University of Melbourne. I came to SLU, I've been here for 21 years now. I'm currently oversee all of our graduate programs in the Department of Computer Science. Um, my particular research is very interdiscipl interdisciplinary um, between mathematics and computer science, um, but we have applications and grant work that we're doing with studying plants for studying um, bioinformatics for studying artificial intelligence. Um, so just like many of our faculty members, I do a lot of interdisciplinary work. Wonderful. And I think I think that is the key word today. And I think for our students, that is really a phenomenal um, experience because we're really not keeping them siloed, but um, really leveraging all the resources here at SLU. So as I had mentioned, um, uh, Dr. Letcher will be covering our MS in AI, CS, and software engineering. Um, David, kind of to kick this off, you had mentioned research, but can you, I think this is the area where a lot of students get very interested, you know, kind of some of our reach research expertise. Can you kind of highlight some areas that we are very well known for here at SLU within your department? Sure, and we have a lot going on in our department. Um, and a lot, lot of it does tie into other disciplines because computer science is now affecting every discipline in every field of work. So for example, we have a faculty member who works on human trafficking using artificial intelligence techniques to help stop human trafficking and help control that around the world. We have faculty members working on sort of the next generation internet and how does one secure it and the uh, internet of things. We have faculty member extremely relevant in the US right now with a major hurricane hitting uh, Florida, we have a faculty member that works with coordinating drones with first responders working on the ground so that they can work together and maximize their resources. We have uh, faculty members that do bioinformatics research that try to analyze human and animal genomes and try to um, solve sort of cutting edge problems there. Um, we've got data science. We've got um, we've got experts in natural language processing that actually apply um, artificial intel intelligence techniques to understanding and preser preserve minority languages around the world. We, and this is only just a tiny bit of things. We've got virtual reality. We've got, you know, as you can see on the list, there's more and more. Yeah, and so no, just, I mean, extremely it's active. Yeah, I love seeing your excitement for it because, you know, for the students and our agents that are working with students, it, there's a lot of opportunities here. I think that's kind of the main message and a lot of um, high expertise and I think similar to MS in engineering and ability for our students to get involved in that research, which is what helps them propel into further graduate work or into those kind of professionally focused environments. Um, so what I want to do is kind of uh, dive into each three of these degrees, um, kind of kicking off with um, computer science, which I think is usually the one where students kind of land uh, mentally first, and then we'll go um, through the other two. Um, so can you kind of talk about computer science, the curriculum? How might that be different from like, let's say a traditional computer engineering? What could a student expect to learn? And why would they choose 
kind of help a student make the distinction between CS, AI, and software and kind of which one's right, and maybe any portability between them, because this is often a question we have of, you know, if I start in CS, but I find I have a, a high interest in AI or software, can I move and how would that, that look kind of within your department? Certainly. So computer science is probably our most general of our degrees. Um, so students in there get a balance of coursework and hands-on experience in sort of the three major areas of computer science as we view it. So this would be software systems, you know, where we're developing computer software, um, the theory behind um, computer science. This is analyzing algorithms and data structures and things like that. And then computer systems, you know, networking, security in those areas. And then as part of the curriculum, students also then take a, a variety of courses in fields that in, um, where they apply these three main, main things. So these, these may be our um, application fields, bioinformatics or computer vision in sort of art courses in artificial intelligence or machine learning going more in depth into systems or large scale systems how does how does one leverage highly parallel computer systems um, within this program there's a thesis option so we have a number of students who would go on and uh, do a do thesis research with one of our faculty members um, and in some cases these these may be funded off um, grants and that we often have assistantships for some of our students um, who are participating in this research. Um, but it's, it's, it's like I said, it's really our most, most general one. Now within there, we have, give students a lot of latitude to choose coursework that, that customizes their experience for themselves. So what, what are they interested in? What do they think will be most lucrative for them for future careers? Careers. Um, so you can sort of weight things a little bit more one direction or another um, based off your interests. Um, we de definitely have students moving back and forth between our different programs. If they discover they're more interested in the AI courses, then they might do the more specialized degree in, in artificial intelligence. Or if they're more into software development, they would do our software engineering program. Perfect. Well, and on that note, um, we'll kind of uh, transition over to AI because, you know, I think this is obviously, you know, Sylvia had mentioned in bi biomedical and our engineering school, it, it is such a huge and growing field. Can you talk a little bit about our specialty in AI and kind of the where this this program at our institution kind of came from? And because uh, we are seeing a lot of interest in this particular program globally. Oh, I mean, it's the the interest is enormous, both SLU and everywhere. I mean, we have students, not just in our program, but in other programs, hoping to take our artificial intelligence courses and machine learning courses. Um, so this is a little more specialized. This is going to be students who are going to go into data science or um, analyzing, working with autonomous systems or analyzing, doing computer vision, analyzing images. We have a lot going on in those those fields. and. This is really just sort of starting to take off right now. We're finding that employers love the idea that somebody has special specialization in artificial intelligence because it is being used in every industry right now. And they love seeing students coming out of programs that have that specific um, skill set. So we think this is actually, you know, if that's where your interests lie, you know, is a is a great direction. And it's it's growing so fast that the jobs are endless. Okay. Yeah, and jobs, jobs, jobs. I think that's um, uh, you know <laughs> of high importance for students making that investment coming. And then on our last area, software engineering. So th this takes specialization in a different direction. It's really going to be about the process of designing software, not just being a computer programmer, but how do you coordinate large teams? How do you work together on these enormous projects? I mean, if you think of companies like Google, they have projects with hundreds of developers. Well, how do you coordinate? How, how do you design? How do you make sure that software doesn't break? How do you test it? How do you make sure it works well for people? Um, so this really dives into those that specialty of really the combination of being a software developer, but also perhaps going into management of managing teams of software development. We have a lot of people that work with our entrepreneurial center for this. We have um, students who often have secondary skill sets in business, so they can try to integrate their business skills mm -hmm. along with their computer skills. Well, and I love that you highlight that it's something Sridhar mentioned, kind of the entrepreneurship, which is within our business school, but that's an area that's very strong here at SLU. Um, you know, and I think all three of you have highlighted something that's just very critical about the SLU experience is, 
you know, our curriculum, our faculty, and our research are kind of triangulating around our a student's success, both academically, but to ensure that forward trajectory is really successful, which I think at the end of the day is one of the reasons we're so highly ranked is because because the outcomes are so high for students. So I'm really glad you touched on that point. Um, you know, we will talk a little bit later about entry requirements, but I think especially for many of our counselors um, who have joined and some of our team around the world, one unique aspect um, at, here at SLU, and it's because of the supportive environment that we can provide, is our CS program, so AI and software engineering, as well as CS at the master's level. Um, we do have a background and non-background option. So traditionally, students will be coming directly from, you know, computer science or something very closely related. Um, but with our non-background option, we are able to review applicants who come from traditional STEM programs at bare minimum um, for consideration into our supported non-background option. And David, I wanted to kind of kind of talk through this a little bit more than what we see on paper and kind of entry requirements, but really how does this kind of work in reality? So if we're bringing a student, let's say from a more traditional engineering program that doesn't have as much of the programming or algorithms or the, the, the core fundamentals, how does a non-background student, you know, succeed here and what kind of support do we have around them in addition to the regular kind of curriculum? So this is a place where for these students, we're actually going to develop a custom curriculum specific for the individual. I and the team will review every single applicant in their background. We'll try to figure out where are their strengths in computer science and where are places that because they worked in a different discipline, they don't have it. So what we'll, we'll do is we'll come up with foundational coursework for you to take that will prepare you for some of the more advanced computer science courses. Um, and we'll, and a few things about this is this will be a little bit of extra coursework, but it will get you into CS. What we are finding is, especially if you're willing to come in the summer and work in the, take classes in the summer, um, there's really not a, much of a delay for graduation. Um, many of our students are still graduating in two years if they're willing to put the time in during the summer. Um, it's it's also since uh, for our programs are all inclusive, this doesn't cost anything additional for the, for this extra coursework. It's all included as part of the package. Um, and what we'll find is we'll get we have some students who have more programming, so and they might not need extra programming courses, but they might not have seen the theory courses. They might need to take an algorithms course. They might need some more practice in software development. Whatever that student needs, we've got specific courses for them to take to bring them up to, you know, the, the, you know, the top level of knowledge so that they can see, succeed in the other coursework. Um, and we're seeing students from mostly engineering programs, but we're seeing students from other STEM disciplines coming in. We're seeing occasional business students. Um, but we, we really try to bridge that gap between where you are and where you want to be um, and come up with something that works for you. Well, and I, I think that's a really important uh, reminder for our, our audience here to remember is that kind of customization, you know, we're able to offer this because of the, the, the resources we have as an institution to really defining a curriculum and that is most suited both to the students incoming background as well as their interest level and I think that um, really is supportive. Um, I think you also noted something extremely important um, of interest for students and our counselors who are working with non-background students is that, as David mentioned, um, any of the kind of, let's say, prerequisite courses or foundation courses would not be um, charged, um, the, the tuition would still be our normal package pricing. So that's a really great benefit that they, you know, typically can get this completed in the same amount of time, but they're not going to have an additional tuition charge. Um, and David, I believe for all three of these programs, there are a minimum of three electives. So some of those kind of prereqs could kind of fold into the electives. Is that a, a fair assessment where if they only needed one or two, they could potentially use it um, with their electives? Um, no, they're actually not, don't count as electives. They just help prepare you for the traditional coursework, but there's still going to be plenty of time to take care okay, of uh, um, in your interests. Oh, wonderful. Oh, okay, great. And I know we did have one specific question in here. Um, if somebody is coming from um, an electric 
electrical and electrical engineering. Um, so typically, um, you know, students, if it's a traditional STEM program coming out of an engineering school, whether it's like a triple E, ECE, electronics engineering, those would be students that, you know, provided that they kind of meet the minimum requirements um, would be considered for admission. They'd have to go through faculty review to make that final determination. But I think that would be um, a candidate that would be most likely successful. So yes, I think that's a um, a good question. All right, um, David, we're always asked about kind of career and preparation, and you know, like our engineering program, um, the CS programs have really high outcomes, um, both from just where we're located because we're in a large city with many multinational companies based here, but a lot of private and smaller and entrepreneurial companies, and nationally and globally. Um, can you kind of speak a little bit to just the careers that we're seeing students going into, companies that are visiting our campus, kind of the experience that um, you've seen just with our domestic and international students um, so far in these programs. I mean, the students who are successful in our program are doing amazingly well, both during their time here and after they leave SLU. Right now, we're probably seeing being a quarter or a third of our students are doing internships while they're here. So this allows them to do CPT and gain additional experience. Um, about half of those are with local companies, whether it's big companies like Boeing or telecom companies or things like that. Um, a lot are with startups. There's a huge startup industry in St. Louis. There's, um, but pretty much every industry is hiring. And then there's a, also a large portion of students who are doing their internships remotely. Um, because, you know, with, with in COVID days, people have learned that we can work remotely well. So we're seeing a lot of students doing internships, even with, with Google and Amazon, who are doing, it, doing, them, doing them remotely. Um, and this really leverages students really well and to get into continuing on with OPT and jobs afterwards because they've already had experience with companies. Um, the, you know, I mean, computer science related fields are among the most highly demanded ones. Um, all the job projections for the next decade, 20 years out, are saying it's only going to grow. There's, St. Louis has an enormous shortage. Everywhere has an enormous shortage of, of experienced computer mm -hmm. professionals. Um, and these students are coming out who are, who are succeeding in our program are coming out with, you know, getting amazing jobs when they leave and, and doing very well. In fact, one of our graduates not long um, from a few years ago was just profiled in St. Louis Bank, or I'm sorry, St. Louis Business Journal being one of the top 40, under 40 innovators in St. Louis. Perfect. Well, and I um, I think one thing that we always highlight, and it's evidence today, again, um, having our faculty who are taking time to be able to meet with students and our counselors from around the world is the fact that, you know, Students can relate, especially international students, to how do you get a job? Well, typically in most countries, and it's no different here in the U.S., it's networking. It's really, you know, meeting the people. And I think one thing that's a hallmark of the SLU education at the grad level is the fact that we have faculty who are taking time today to do a presentation in our morning to make sure that we're finding the quality candidates all the way through graduation. And that ability to actually know your faculty is a really huge benefit of coming to St. Louis University. University because, you know, I think Sylvia, Sridhar, David, all three of you can attest to, companies are contacting our university looking for the best graduates who they're graduating. And it's those networking opportunities that's having, you know, our location in a large city, you know, large employers are right at our doorstep. So I think these are really wonderful highlights when we talk about kind of career preparation. Um, I want to dive into some kind of more SLU or St. Louis, um, more general. Um, and the three of you, please chime in if you, if you have anything to add from your specific expertise in this area. But, um, you know, for students coming from around the world, St. Louis may not be top of mind, but I think it should be. Um, we're a larger US city, and I talk a lot about balance. So we have 3 million people here, which if you're coming from China or India, 3 million probably is a small town, but um, it's a sizable city for the United States. Um, but we really kind of, as we say, punch above our weight in the location of very large companies that are globally headquartered in St. Louis. And um, we have very large industries in biotechnology, um, healthcare, logistics, 
logistics, banking, finance, um, you know, manufacturing is sweetheart really talked about. We have, you know, kind of this, we just won, uh, the city won a, a very large investment in kind of uh, advanced manufacturing. So a lot of work is happening here and opportunities, um, but it's really balanced with that cost of living. So as an international student, if one of your first questions is, I need a scholarship, I need assistantship, which are good questions. Um, you also have to think about cost of living and can you afford to live in a place? So many students in different countries have heard of New York and Los Angeles or Chicago, but those are incredibly expensive places to launch your academic career. And you can actually do that and have a wonderful life here and access to employers. So I think that's really important to highlight. Um, you know, I think uh, Sweetheart talked about a lot of the fortune companies. We have a very large base of fortune companies that are headquartered right Right here in St. Louis. Um, and we have many companies that are globally known and recognized that have large operations here. Everything from Boeing, which has a very, very large office, more primarily focused on defense. Uh, MasterCard, which has one of their global IT operation centers, so they do more financial security and processing, um, is headquartered right here in St. Louis. So you have opportunities that, that have been kind of illuminated from our faculty um, that are really evidenced by the companies that you see just on the screen and hundreds and hundreds hundreds more, and that's just here in St. Louis. Um, St. Louis University has a reputation known around the country as an elite institution, so a degree from SLU will carry weight whether you go to another U.S. city. Um, so that's really important when you think about that investment um, that you're looking at. Um, I did have one highlight, and I think it was Dr. Condor. Sweetheart, I think you mentioned um, Venture Cafe and Cortex. Um, maybe could you expand on that, because Cortex is a, a an innovation district adjacent to our campus. Um, and they have uh, Venture Cafe, which is like, I believe, a weekly kind of meetup with professionals. But can you kind of expand on that? Because I, I did have a slide for that. So it started uh, almost a decade ago. Cambridge Innovation Center, which is the incubator opposite to MIT, started first incubator outside Massachusetts. That was in very close to like walking distance from SLU. So part of the, um, there are many startups in this incubator, plus they have Venture Cafe every Thursday evening, uh, four to six, you can go uh, attend workshop, meet people, have a drink and uh, socialize. And it's a great opportunity because if you think about two years time, you probably have 100 opportunities to network, okay? And that is, uh, part of the thing, we also have opportunities inside SLU to network with companies too. So their networking is critical if you want to get placed in a really good job. And may I add to that very quickly? So the, the biomedical engineering students have a program that's actually student-led, which is called MedLaunch. And so those are groups of students that come together under the guidance of a faculty usually, uh, and they come up with innovations. They work on basically innovative ideas. Um, they can then claim uh, intellectual property and they are sponsored uh, so somewhat. So they do some of their work is done at, at the Cortex and many of them actually have gone on to start their own companies. We do have actually companies launched from biomedical engineering because of the med launch and also because of faculty research. But it's a, again, it's a great resource for students who are entrepreneurial minded and sim or simply want to learn more about um, small business. Yeah, no wonder what uh, the, the wonderful kind of insight. And I, you know, I think we, we talk about these innovation districts, but really as sweetheart, as you mentioned, it, Cortex is at our, at our doorstep. It's adjacent yeah. to our campus. So, you know, networking opportunities, a thriving entrepreneurship district. And, you know, in all of these fields that we've talked about today, entrepreneurship, Entrepreneurship is a huge fundamental kind of launching pad. We see students creating IT companies. We see students making medical devices, um, you know, working in kind of ancillary companies to aerospace and aviation industry. So a really great benefit because of our location um, as well. So I know we had a few questions in uh, the chat. And, oh, thank you, David, for um, 
going over that. Um, let's focus a little bit on our remaining time today on kind of entry requirements and what we're looking for. So for all of the programs that we mentioned today at the master's level, we do offer both direct entry, which is meaning students meet all the minimum requirements from kind of an evaluated GPA perspective, as well as a language perspective. But we do also have an accommodating graduate pathway that can um, support students um, their first semester or two, should they have a GPA that doesn't quite, you know, at the academic background needs a little bit additional support or they need more support from a language requirement. And I always talk about the pathway from a perspective that the language is not really to teach you English, but to ensure that your English, both spoken English and writing especially, is at a level for graduate research, graduate presentation. Many of our international students are coming from countries and cultures where speaking in class is generally something that doesn't happen um, because, you know, you listen to your professor, you take notes, but it's very encouraged and really a critical component of the educational model here at SLU and in the United States to really be active and engaged in the classroom and being a participant in this academic environment. So the pathway can really support students to kind of shape and model that international experience into one that will be successful in our classroom. So I want to give a little bit of time to both of the departments to talk about kind of in general terms um, what you're looking for in a successful candidate um, beyond just the GPA or the language requirements with which are more codified here. So maybe we'll start with engineering, sweetheart, and Sylvia. Kind of when you're looking at an applicant, I mean, this is a question that comes up a lot internationally. Um, you know, you have a student from, let's say, electrical engineering, and they say, I want to do mechanical. Or you have a student who comes from something that kind of orbits around engineering, but not exactly. And then some that are really far away from engineering. So can you kind of talk about, you know, a background that maybe is more appropriate or not as accommodating at our institution from uh, their undergraduate work? I think engineering, this specifically is a question that comes up quite frequently. Maybe it's Sridhar. Um, I don't know if you have any insight on that. So the thing that a uh, lot of times uh, students think is we look at the GPA and we look at the scores. Uh, the statement of purpose is really critical. We want you to think and say, this is where I'm heading and the education at SLU would help me to get where you want. In some respects, uh, if you are planning to pursue aerospace from electrical background, and if you can communicate to us in your statement of purpose, why that would help you and why you are interested in aerospace. And that really helps uh, to make a decision whether to admit or not. Obviously, if you are switching branches, there could be some prerequisites, but again, the prerequisites, the fund, the tuition amount is a flat tuition, so it doesn't matter. So for us to make the decision, it's important to know why you want to make that switch. And I would like to add, that's, that's actually excellent. Just, just something specific for biomedical engineering, because I know that biomedical engineering is not a common degree. <laughs> Uh, yet outside of US. Um, we do accept students from other disciplines as long as they are somewhat related to biomedical engineering. Uh, and I can tell you we have had students who come from a physics degree or biology, molecular biology, or maybe um, other science disciplines, uh, also other engineering disciplines or simply biotechnology or pharmaceutical sciences, uh, even from nursing. Hmm. Now, uh, if you come from those degrees, you might have other prerequisites that you have to take, just like Sridhar said. Um, but, but then again, uh, why do you want to switch is the important part. Like, why do you want to become a biomedical engineer and where do you think that would take you in your career? Um, I also want to mention the one important thing for engineering is your math classes. Um, so this is something that I advise usually all of the students. If you think that you would like to get a master's engineer, but you don't have the, the proper math degree, so it's kind of like a four levels of math and differential equations and some statistics, you can take those anywhere. You can take those online if you want. You can take them at the community college. You can take them once you come here. But that might be like something to think about um, that you can start preparing yourself even before you apply or as you're applying or as you are you know, studying maybe the language. Um, and so forth. So this is like really the important part is the math and then the rest will help you catch up with the prerequisites. 
Wonderful. And I think to kind of encapsulate, you know, kind of what I'm hearing for both of you, and it's true, there are many of our degree programs is, and sweetheart, a very good point on the statement of purpose is this holistic evaluation of a student. So if there is, you know, a really great explanation why a student might be making a, a transition between an undergrad degree and into one of these um, excellent degree programs, um, you know, we do look at the entirety of a student. And I think that's part of um, what makes SLU such a special place, part of that Jesuit education, educating the whole person, but understanding the entirety of a, an individual. And we can do that because of the community. We can do that because of the, the high focus our faculty have on each applicant. Um, and so I think those are really wonderful points. Let's transition to David. I know we have a lot of questions about kind of background, non-background, um, kind of Department of Computer Science, when you're looking at applicants, I think, you know, we're seeing a lot of applicants from kind of electrical and kind of orbiting engineering programs, but I think diving a little bit more into that non background is, is something that's of high interest, kind of the support, what we're looking for, what we're not. Um, can you kind of maybe expand on that a little bit more? Sure. I mean, certainly our applicants sort of really fall into the two categories. Those traditional ones that have done computer science or information systems or something that is right on background for what our undergraduates would have done in the United States. And those are, you know, relatively easy for us to evaluate because we see, you know, app, we're comparing apples to apples. We see exactly what your background is. Um, the place we have to look more carefully is with the students who have different backgrounds. Um, the biggest ones we see are certainly people with electrical communication, com computer engineering, communications engineering are probably our three biggest fields that we see students coming into. Um, unfortunately, when we look at individual transcripts for these students, they will all have had some computer programming background for, for in, the, in those fields specifically. So we can see, try to evaluate your potential in programming. You know, Maybe you haven't done a lot, a lot of computer science, but it's, maybe it stands out that that's something you've done really well with in, within your curriculum. Um, we certainly look to see, are you overall a strong student? Because if you're not a, you know, a good student, then doesn't, you know, you're going to have, have, have challenges. Um, one of the things we, we were also seeing a lot of applicants who come after spending a few years in industry. So we try to evaluate that industry experience and see, okay, how does that highlight you? How does that help you? Maybe you weren't the best student as an undergraduate, but you've got some great software engineering experience we can take that into account and say, okay, well, they're proving they can do it and are ready to come back to school and, and, and flourish. So we, we try to look at the individual cases of how are the, the students ones that we think SLU can help out and get to where they want, want to be. Wonderful. I think that's a good description because that our new non-background kind of track is, is, it's, it's unique. Um, and I think overwhelmingly it's, it's, really doing the work, you know, across all of our departments, and especially with this unique um, situation of the faculty are looking at the the applications and the applicant. And as Rita mentioned, the statement of purpose, the resume describing mm -hmm. the work experience can all influence an admissions decision. Um, it's not to say if you check all those boxes, that's guaranteed, but this holistic evaluation of the potential for future success in our program and the care that each one of you and all of our faculty take in reviewing and kind of curating that incoming class is really phenomenal. Um, I kind of want to round out everything just with some scholarship um, information as well. I'll ask you all um, about any assistantships because I know that typically comes up. But um, what's unique about all of the programs that we've discussed today is they are package priced. So for direct entry, they all do have a total package pricing of 42,000 USD. And when we think about package pricing, many international students think in terms of two years, they say, oh, is that 42,000 each year or per year, um, it's unique. Um, and we do this to help students really plan and estimate their financial investment. So working with their family or their sponsors or going to get bank loans. So we can say the total tuition for direct entry is 42,000. And we do add admission, um, review students for scholarship kind of on a merit-based um, 
evaluation of the application. So there's no separate application for scholarship. Um, all students are considered. Um, typically, it's kind of a blend of the academic background and potential for future success. And then also looking at any work experience, while not required, can influence that merit-based scholarship. So for MS and engineering programs, the scholarship um, maximum can go up to 10,000 and for the CS department up to 20,000. Now, those are at the very high end of those ranges. Typically, students who are kind of in that average kind of normal range would be at the midpoint or a little bit lower um, for very highly specialized students that could move um, a little bit higher. Um, in addition, um, for many of our, our students coming through these programs, they will also be um, in via direct entry invited to participate in SLU's IGNITE program, which is an opportunity for students to engage before arrival, so before orientation and different activities that get them involved in our community beforehand and they're kind of micro um, scholarships. So if you engage in the opportunity, you could potentially earn a scholarship applied to your second year. So those are other ways to really directly influence your scholarship opportunities. Um, I real quickly ask um, uh, each department um, kind of how assistantships work or if there are opportunities or not. I know we do mostly primarily work on a scholarship um, kind of that's how we function from a funding opportunity, but are there assistantships and if so, how do they work in each of your, you know, engineering and then computer science and so maybe Sridhar or Sylvia, do assistantships exist and if so, kind of how does that work in your department? Sylvia, you want to go first? Sure. Um, yeah. I mean, assistantships, uh, they, they exist. Um, so assistantships, however, are typically given for research uh, students. Um, you know, just kind of like so. It's kind of it's a tu sometimes a tuition waiver, um, and um, additional stipend, health insurance that like, could be given for research students. However, uh, the non thesis MS students sometimes get a flat rate, um, simply tuition waiver for a certain number of credits, and that also depends on merit. Um, also, we have an, an example. Of a variety of scholarships like which are posted on the website which all students um are can apply for um i eligible to apply some of them you just have to be careful whether you have to be a citizen but most of them you don't have to be a citizen or a resident so they're open to everybody those are smaller scholarships they might be just able to pay for your book maybe or um, a small amount of money that helps with uh, just living expenses but there are a variety, they are posted, um, and the students can look through those and start applying, especially once they're on campus and we have um, had a, you know, a good good impression of the students and you can write, um, let's say, <laughs> recommendation letters and so forth. So then the chance of students getting those scholarships might be a little bit better. Oh, great. And Srihar, anything to add from engineering perspective? Apart from that, um... We have a lot of uh, positions for graders. So uh, all our classes are taught by faculty, but grading is done by graduate students. So there are opportunities to be a grader, get some uh, pocket money for this uh, month. Okay. And we pay pretty good $15 per hour or something like that for a, a grader. So there is a possibility, a lot of possibilities for that. Wonderful, awesome. And David, I don't know if you're you're still around. I can't see um, if you are. Any assistantships that you all have in your department? Yes, yeah, so there's sort of three types of funding that we'll have for students. One is a research assistantship. Now that is primarily for our PhD students and some of our advanced master students. They'll be helping on individual faculty members' research projects and help drive them. And these are really our, our sort of our top students have those opportunities. We also have teaching assistants. So these are gonna be opportunities to help both our undergraduate and our graduate courses, which would um, come with uh, a, a fixed salary and some, you typically some tuition waivers. Um, those, those are usually not available to our first, our first year students because we need to get to know you first to see where you can help out. Um, but the third source, and this is the place that we've got the most students being involved, are also helping out in other things in the department, primarily teaching. So this can be graders, this could be learning assistants actually helping out in the classroom, laboratory assistants, tutors that we hire for hourly rates, which are competitive rates. And the nice thing is you can work on campus and it doesn't count towards CPT or anything like that. And you can um, gain some useful experience. Once again, those are usually 
not given to our first semester students because we need to get to know you. But right now, I think we've got about 50 of our students working for us this semester. Right. Um, doing doing hourly work, so there's some there's some great opportunities to earn earn some funds and gain some great experience. Wonderful, thank you for that. Um, so there are funding opportunities, mm -hmm. primarily in the form of scholarships and some limited mm -hmm. assistantships um, mm -hmm. across um, our programs in mm -hmm. these departments. Um, I did put up the QR codes that link directly to these programs. Um, I know we're at time. I just want to say um, thank you to all of our participants today for joining us from wherever you are in the world. I know some people are up very early in the morning or extremely late. Um, you know, if you are a student who's joining us here at St. Louis University um, for an upcoming semester, um, we look forward to welcoming you to campus. Please make sure you follow all the next steps for, um, you know, securing your visa. Um, if you have questions, please contact your admissions counselor. We will have a wonderful and robust orientation on January 17th. Can't wait to see you all here. Um, and to our expert faculty, David, Sridhar, and Sylvia, thank you so much at this busy time of year for taking your time. Um, we will be sharing this recording outward to our network and to any students in your programs, but um, I can't thank you all three enough. I mean, you really ex exemplify the SLU experience by taking your time today, um, and thank you for that. Um, and to all of our participants, I will share the, the recording if you would like to review or share onward. Um, thank you to you all today and to our participants. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.